When I was a child, I liked to draw pictures as realistically as possible with a picture reference. One day, I drew a picture of an object, and as a child, I was very proud of how close it was to a photo, and showed it to my father. And he simply told me, why don't you take a picture? Right? <laughs> Because ever since, something between that drawing and the photograph has captured my fascination. Because if I was just copying a photograph, how can my drawing be better than a photograph? How can I add even more realism than what a 2D photograph can offer? Can I make it even better than just an actual photograph? So more than 10 years later, I went to USC's PhD program to answer some of those questions. And literally, my research has been using modern photography to create computer graphics of real-world objects, such as my scrunchy face. <laughs> I work at the intersection of computer graphics and artificial intelligence, and my goal is to create our virtual selves that we can believe as a real person. My parents live in Japan, and this is a picture when they saw my son for the first time. There's something amazing in human face-to-face -face communication because the facial expression is the most fundamental form of human communication. It's programmed in our brain, and it's the only language we can communicate with a baby, even across different cultures. Also, unlike 2D videos, we can make an eye contact, which establishes a context between multiple participants and enhances a feeling that we are sharing the same space. What if we can recreate this entire experience in a virtual world? With virtual telepresence that are so convincing, we can meet with anyone just like we are talking to each other face to face. What if we can preserve a piece of you and share your experience and stories and memories to future generations? We had a chance to work with USC's Shoah Foundation on a project to create a 3D visual archive of Holocaust survivors. Imagine in the future classroom, we can have a lifelike conversation with a digital version of the testimonies. And in a few decades or so, this will be the only way to pass our experience to future generations. And this is what we achieved. How did you survive the Holocaust? How did I survive? I survived, I believe, because Providence watched over me. And also, the fact that for a long time, my parents uh, watched over us and guarded us and kept us hidden for, for almost three and a half years. And here's how he did it. Here's Pinka Scooter the first testimony we recorded sitting in a special camera array we built. Our goal is to preserve the authentic stories of the survivors. So we pre-recorded all the interviews using all the questions you can possibly imagine. So this shows about half of the cameras we use to record the interview. And you might wonder why we need this many cameras. Because to achieve truly engaging human interaction, we needed to capture hand gestures an eye gaze. Also, somehow, we needed to figure out how to show these view-dependent images from a viewer's angle. So if I ask a question to Pincus, he looks at me in the eye and answers the question. So we built a special 3D display that consists of hundreds of miniature video projectors that can render appropriate angles for each viewer. A cool thing about this display is that, just like a hologram, you can see a lifelike 3D floating figure from any perspectives without wearing special 3D glasses. So we combine this with a conversational AI system. You can imagine something like Siri or Alexa. So if I ask a question, he can answer. Imagine giving a face to your virtual assistant. With sensors in the living room, not only they can see you, but now you can see them and understand what they're thinking. This will make the interaction so much more engaging and compelling. 
So to tell a convincing story, we need believable character. And movies have been using digital avatars to make anyone believe anything. And some of the most successful digital avatars can be seen in the visual effects industry. In the movie Furious 7, one of the main actors, Paul Walker, died before completing the movie, and the production needed to use CGI to finish the project. But achieving an effect like this is extremely time consuming. It takes weeks or months of work and needs an army of digital artists, engineers, and researchers. So part of my research goal is to figure out how to create these high fidelity 3D digital assets at scale. So an effective way to achieve this is to use a lot of high resolution cameras to capture the face and borrow as much likeness and performance from a real actor. Here's an example from a movie, Logan, where we helped create a younger version and older version of the Wolverine character. The technique we use is called a 3D capture, and at USC, we have a special device called a light stage, which is an LED dome with a bunch of cameras. So this takes a lot of pictures from different lighting conditions, and from that data, you can create a CGI face that looks something like this. So if you compare this with a real photo, it's nearly indistinguishable. But we are extremely sensitive to how the human face should look like. So to create a CJ face that holds up at close-ups, something you can see in the movies, we need to go beyond what a normal camera can see. So this video shows a multi-scale nature of human uh, facial features. As you can notice, human skin has like crazy many details that perhaps actually you didn't want to notice, like small <laughs> ridges and grooves between pores and wrinkles, and they just keep repeating uh, all the time. So just like the tiny particles in the cosmetics completely change the reflection on the face, we can still see these tiny details on the face as a last of the face, which is a very important property to be captured. So we came up with a new simulation algorithm that can synthesize these tiniest skin details on the face. And here's a rendering we created using that algorithm. Although these structures are in the order of just a few microns, a hundredth of a millimeter, we can feel the tension when she makes a smile expression. But until recently, creating a realistic digital face was only possible to a big film studio. But something changed. Over the last several years, the graphics card is so much better. And we have a lot more high-resolution images on the internet that are available for machine learning. And every year, we have exponentially more machine learning and deep learning papers coming out. And suddenly, deepfake came out. So deepfake is a technology to create a fake video of someone saying and doing something that they never said or did, often using a deep learning algorithm. That's why it's called deepfake. It went viral when someone passed software on the internet that allows anyone to create realistic face swapping videos of celebrities. While there are concerns, what's interesting to me as a researcher is that Something once only a big film studio can do, now suddenly can be achieved by a non-technical user at no cost. And here's another example from a different artist, where the face of Jack Nicholson is swapped with Jim Carrey's, and perhaps showing how a serious horror movie could be turned into a comedy. <laughs> and currently, training a machine learning model like this requires a few days for training and thousands of internet photos. But imagine in the future if anyone can create a realistic digital avatar with a click of a button, the possibility is limitless for storytellers and content creators. So we developed a new technology at Pinscreen that allows you to create a realistic digital face from a single picture. And this even works in real time. So on the left, I am moving my mouth. And on the top right, we show the real photos of the three subjects we picked. On the lower right, we show the synthesized faces that mimic my facial expressions. 
Although we can't even see the teeth in these input pictures, this technology can imagine highly realistic teeth that look plausible even when the head turns left and right. And let me show you how it works in the live demo. So here I have a single webcam and a laptop. And here I have a single target picture right here. So if I double click this image, this program just instantaneously built a 3D model of the target. So here's my video feed. Oh. Sorry. Okay. okay, this blue face is tracking my facial expressions. So it, if I open the mouth, it follows. It's also tracking this, my 3D head pose. So if I look left, it follows. Now I can transfer my facial expressions and head pose to the target 3D model. Then now I can puppeteer the 3D face. Now, if I combine a realistic texture from a le deep learning algorithm, all of a sudden I can do realistic face swapping. Are we slightly closer to the technology in Mission Impossible? <laughs> or we can bring back our iconic characters to life, for example, Audrey Hepburn. And maybe she might want to say <laughs> something like, I miss acting for movies. <laughs> or I can bring in my favorite Japanese actor. And perhaps he might want to say, Shout out to Vilno, Miyasan, konnichiwa. Or I can be an astronaut and ask a question, is this technology a great step forward for all humankind? <laughs> okay, that, that's it for my real-time demo. <laughs> okay, now we continue to work on this technology and push this technology even further and now made it even work on a mobile phone. Uh, you can get the app at pinscreen.com. Now, where is this technology going next? I think one of many areas that digital avatars can revolutionize is the fashion industry. This is something we're developing that allows you to preview how the clothing fits you fully digitally. In the future, you can customize your ideal clothing online and check if you like it or not using your own avatar before you buy it. Want to look better than your actual self? You can even customize your face, body, even hair, and pose for a fashion magazine, and perhaps you can get a million followers on Instagram. <laughs> Digital avatars have enormous potential to achieve something we have never seen. But as we see all the other technologies, there is always a risk for potential misuse. So to raise the awareness, we have been working with key industry figures and political leaders to raise the awareness of the technology and showing what's currently possible. Also, as a countermeasure, we collaborate with media forensics experts at UC Berkeley on a deepfake detection algorithm using our own technology to fight against deepfake. I believe whether this, the future of this technology is scary or amazing, depends on how we use it. And if we use it correctly, it can transform our daily lives by revolutionizing our online communication, social presence, and content creation, and greatly improve humanity in connecting people around the world, and preserving part of our important history and cultures, and achieving something more that we can't even imagine. Today, I talked about my research in 3D digital humans that tell you so much more than just photos. They look like a real person from any angles. They can make an eye contact. They can do intimate face-to-face -face conversation in close-ups. A common theme in all my research is that the result is photoreal because I use a photograph as a reference. But what I learned from creating computer graphics from photos is that the photograph actually doesn't tell you anything about the realism of an object. In fact, if you don't know anything about what makes someone look like him or her, we can blindly copy every single detail down to a single pore, 
and can achieve a photorealistic look. But as shown in art expressions, the reality we see from the same image depends on a person to person, and a photograph or video has never been and it will never be the true representation of the reality we see. It's you who decides what you believe as a reality. Now, what do you believe? Thank you. <laughs>